The white forest crawled with Soviet soldiers. The men moved through the trees silently, wading through nearly waist-deep snow. Each breath froze on their faces, leaving their eyelashes tipped with white. It was easily below negative 30 degrees Celsius, the coldest conditions a lot of these men had ever experienced. Their commanding officer walking in the middle of the squadron fell into the snow face first. A split second later, a bang ripped through the trees. Sniper! The cry went up but was immediately silenced by another bullet, followed a moment later by a bang. The men scattered in all directions, diving behind trees and rocks, staring out ahead of them to spot where the enemy soldier was hiding. There were 25 of them in the squad, more than enough to take down one Finnish gunman. But as hard as each of them looked, no one could see where the shots were coming from. There was no barrel smoke, not a glint on a scope, not even a puff of air from the man breathing. It was like they were fighting a ghost. The bullets continued to whiz through the forest one after another with almost perfect regularity. Each one was followed by a loud, echoing crack. The men laid down flat, totally behind cover. There was no way a sniper in front of them could possibly pick them off, but one by one the men kept slumping in the snow dead. Cries of panic echoed around the group. Where was their killer hiding? Some of the soldiers lost their cool and tried to run away through the snow, only to fall to the ground after just a couple of steps. Bullet after bullet flew through the trees until there was just one soldier left, cowering behind a rock. How could the sniper be shooting them all from up ahead? Unless… The bullet finished him off before his mind finished putting the pieces together. A few minutes later, a patch of snow rustled, and a short Finnish man stood up, alone in the woods. He was 150 feet behind the Soviets. They'd all walked right past him without even noticing. There was no scope on his rifle, just the iron sights. He spat the last bits of snow out of his mouth and watched as his breath curled into steam again. Very calmly, Simo Haiha, the White Death, packed away his equipment and walked back to camp. It's difficult to say who won the Winter War. Three months into the chaos of the Second World War, shrouded by conflicts erupting all across Europe, the Soviet Union launched an invasion of Finland. Three months, one week, and six days later, the war was over. Finland had lost 25,904 soldiers, as well as 11% of its land. The Soviets, victorious, had lost between 126,875 and 167,976 soldiers. On average, every Finnish person who died took down six Soviets with them. On paper, the Soviets should have steamrolled this small country. Their military strength dwarfed that of their Nordic neighbors, and yet they struggled to make any meaningful progress all winter. The Soviets walked away from this war, having been embarrassed on the world stage. But how? For starters, the history of the two countries has always been closely tied. The Northern Crusades in the late 13th century saw Finland being absorbed into the Swedish Empire, where it remained for centuries. That was until 1809, when the Russian Empire grew uncomfortable with the Swedes having such close access to the Russian capital of St. Petersburg. Russia captured and annexed Finland, releasing it from one empire directly into the clutches of another, as it then became the Grand Duchy of Finland, an autonomous state ruled by the Russian Empire. Yet, Finland wasn't just a patch of Swedish land or Russian land. It had people with a unique language, culture, mythology, and history. Finland had culture. What the Russians failed to anticipate at this point was the explosion of Finnish culture and national identity that would take place under their rule. Freed from the Swedes and given some level of autonomy, the Finnish people had never before felt so Finnish. Soon enough, they began to ask the question of whether they wanted to be a country in their own right. Russia, realizing what was happening, attempted to assimilate Finland into its empire in the 19th century, but failed, which only further stoked the fires of Finnish independence. Then in 1917, the Russian Empire collapsed entirely, giving Finland a sudden opportunity to secede. Finland capitalized and gained their independence in a matter of months, but their future as a nation was still uncertain. The conservative Finns, known as the Whites, who were pushing for independence, were met with fierce opposition from the pro-Russian Reds. A bloody civil war threatened to divide the new country before it even got going. This could be a whole video in itself, but we'll give you the main events. In the midst of the chaos, a former Russian lieutenant general by the name of Karl Gustav Emil Mannerheim took leadership of the Whites' military. Thanks in large part to his leadership, four months later, the Finns clawed their way to peace. With the Whites victorious and standing at the dawn of their independence, Mannerheim was a hero. Another important detail from this period was how the Whites won the Civil War. Finland didn't previously have much of an established army of their own. No real equipment, structure, training, anything. But they needed it fast. One country, a close ally for many years, stepped in to help them and turned the tide of the Civil War. Imperial Germany. 
Jägers, the German word for hunters, and the term used for infantry became Jägeri in Finnish. The Whites modeled their military closely on the German structure and bought a number of weapons and vehicles to aid them in their victory over the Reds. In many ways, this conflict baked certain international relations into the country right from its inception that would become crucial to its decisions in the Second World War. Germany was seen as an ally, Russia was the enemy, but more on that later. Over the next couple of decades, Finland and Russia settled into a discontented peace, neither side particularly happy about having to share a border with their neighbor. Mannerheim rose even higher through the ranks within Finland, ending up in the position of chairman of the Finnish Defense Council. When given the role in 1931, it came with a warning. It was only a matter of time before war would erupt with the Soviets. Tensions were rising steadily year on year. One particular point of contention for both countries was the border itself, specifically Karelia. This was a piece of land divided in half by the border between the two countries. Historically, it had been Finnish until the Swedes had given the land to the Russian Empire. So once the dust settled from their independence, both countries felt they had a claim to Karelia, but only actually owned half of it. For Finland, it was a point of heritage and identity. There were Finnish people living in East Karelia on the Russian side of the border who should have been unified with the rest of their people. A lot of the Finns in Russian East Karelia agreed with this. Why were they suddenly living in a country different from their ancestors and having to speak a different language? For the Soviets, it was a point of national security. The city of Leningrad was only 20 miles from the Finnish border, and in that stretch of land, there was a growing number of nationalistic Finns. Given Finland's close ties with Germany, the 1930s saw the impending outbreak of World War II intensifying these threats. Stalin was worried. What if Nazi Germany convinced Finland to join the war and allow them to launch an invasion through Karelia? After all, the Finns already liked the Germans and hated the Soviets, remember? Stalin knew he had to act fast. War in Europe was about to break out at any moment, and he couldn't be caught unprepared. What followed in the late 1930s was a period of intense negotiations. Representatives of both countries regularly met with one another in the months leading up to the Second World War. The Soviets came in with their most minimal request, bolstered by the attendance of Joseph Stalin himself in an attempt to underline the importance of the deal. Stalin was friendly and lit up with smiles and goodwill toward the Finnish delegates. He suggested that the Finns give them Karelia in exchange for some more land toward the north of the border. That would allow him to put more space between Leningrad and his potential enemies, as well as take ownership of a number of islands and establish a naval base in the Gulf of Finland. Mannerheim knew the Finnish military better than anyone and pushed for them to accept the deal. In his eyes, they had no choice. The Soviets negotiating peacefully was Stalin offering an olive branch. If the Finns said no, they wouldn't stand a chance against the invading Red Army. But the Finnish government, assuming that the Soviets had come in with their most audacious request, tried to negotiate them down and refused to budge. They were nervous but rebutted Stalin's offers, waiting for him to back off. They knew they didn't have the military power to fight off the Soviets not by a long shot, but public distrust of Russia and a strong reluctance to give up any of the land they'd fought so hard to gain meant the talks reached a stalemate. The Finnish parliament eventually voted no to the Russian demands, much to the surprise of Stalin, who asked jokingly if his votes could be included too. But from that point on, the Soviets stopped attending talks. Stalin had stopped joking around. On the 26th of November 1939, in a small village called Mainila on the Soviet side of the border, a small group of Soviet soldiers exploded. Stationed in a guard post minding their own business, the Soviets were shelled from the Finnish side of the border, totally unprovoked. That gave the Red Army all the reason they needed to ramp up their military presence at the border, something which they had been doing already, and prepare for war. Since the end of the war, historians on both sides have concluded that this event never actually happened. Neither country had any artillery stationed anywhere in range of the village at the time. Stalin had lied, using a false flag event as an excuse to invade Finland and take the land that he believed was rightfully his. At 8 a.m. on November 30, 1939, the Red Army launched their attack. Half a million Soviet soldiers stormed into Finland, a country that only had 3.6 million people in total. To make matters worse, another half a million Soviets were getting ready in reserve. They attacked along almost the entire length of the border, looking to exploit under-defended areas and overwhelm Finland immediately, perhaps inspired by the German invasion of Poland just a couple months earlier. Attack swiftly and from as many directions as possible, stretching the defensive line thin and relying on superior numbers to gain early momentum. And superior numbers they had. 
Stalin sent in over 450,000 soldiers to face 33,000 men in the Finnish National Army, 21 divisions of soldiers against just three. The Red Army had thousands of aircraft and tanks at its disposal, while Finland had less than 70 aircraft and a dozen World War I-era French Renault tanks. What was more is the Soviets had spent months building rail links all the way up the length of the border to supply their troops with food, ammunition, and reinforcements. On top of all that, Stalin had a plan. Their attack would focus on three areas in particular. The Karelian Isthmus, which they knew would be the most heavily fortified part of the front, was also the most open, with a number of lakes that would freeze over in December allowing the Soviets to move tanks and heavy artillery closer to the fortifications. They would fight the Finnish forces here, whilst attempting to flank them where they could, waiting for the rest of the country to fold. And fold it would, because at the top of the border, the Finnish landscape was wild and rural. They didn't anticipate heavy resistance that far out, as the land wasn't well supplied or particularly defensible. So they would send the smaller, less experienced 14th Army to attack the north. The army was tasked with targeting Lapland port of Petsamo and taking the town of Olu on the Gulf of Bothnia. And with those taken, Russia could cut off all foreign aid from reaching Finland from Sweden. And in the center was the key to their strategy. Their battle-hardened 9th Army would attack as a tight unit, slicing Finland in half and severing communications and infrastructure the whole way across. With that accomplished, they would push south, pincering the last of the Finnish defense in Karelia. After defeating those forces, they would push through, taking Viipuri, and then roll toward Helsinki, which would leave them defenseless. They'd destroy the Finnish resistance in no time. Twelve days, to be exact. Lieutenant General Kirill Meretskov estimated the whole conflict to be over in twelve days. At that point, Russia then had to choose to either take the whole of Finland back into its control or just the key areas they identified before the war. But after a couple of days, it was clear that they had massively underestimated their foe. Remember how we said the Finnish army was just 33,000 soldiers? Well, that was true. Their official army was only that large. But unbeknownst to Russia, in the months leading up to the outbreak of the war, Finnish men had been signing themselves up for the reserve forces by the droves under the guise of additional training. The Territorial Army bolstered its military strength to 127,000. They had another 100,000 in the reserves and then a further 100,000 in the Civic Guard. Supporting them were another 100,000 women of the Lotusvard, otherwise known as the Women's Auxiliary Army. Then all of a sudden, the Finnish resistance force wasn't looking too dissimilar to the 450,000 men of the Red Army. What's more, while Mannerheim had been keen to accept the peaceful route proposed by the Soviets, he'd also spent the last eight years of his life preparing his country for this exact scenario. A veteran of World War I and the Russo-Japanese War, Mannerheim had distinguished himself in combat and strategy from a young age. The man was as seasoned a military commander as Finland could have hoped for, but he was not alone. Of the hundreds of thousands of Finnish men who served, many were combat veterans themselves, having fought in their own country during the Civil War and World War I. Mannerheim had the soldiers and the knowledge of how to use them effectively. So how did he plan to save Finland from the almost guaranteed defeat? His priority was to establish a fiercely strong front line at the Karelian Isthmus, called the Mannerheim Line in his honor. There he stationed the bulk of his forces while ensuring to place a good number of troops across the rest of the border all the way up to the Arctic Circle. Mannerheim anticipated the Soviet strategy well. The supposedly unstoppable force of the Red Army met the immovable object of the Finns. Fighting broke out amongst the snowy forests all along the border. The Soviets, dressed in their dark khaki uniforms, stood out like sore thumbs as they tried to push forward. In contrast, the Finns were dressed in all-white uniforms and set themselves up in foxholes and bunkers to the point that they were virtually invisible. Unsure where the enemy was and panicking, the Russians were picked off quickly without having much opportunity to retaliate. The Finnish strategy was simple. Hold the line. Foreign support would eventually come from the UK, France, and Sweden, or Stalin would grow frustrated and broker peace. Until one of those things happened, the Finns wouldn't shift, and with a harsh winter bearing down on them, the Finnish soldiers had one mission, survive. And survive they did. Despite lacking the conventional vehicles of warfare, the Finns knew the land better than anyone and were keenly resourceful. Most of these men had grown up in the countryside where winters were harsh and living was tough. While the Russian soldiers were bogged down wading through waist-deep snow, the Finns used skis to get around quickly and quietly, as they had always done in the winters. The Jaegers, Finland's elite soldiers, had bicycles that they would use to quickly traverse behind the front lines, allowing them to pop up in different spots and perform effective strikes on exposed targets. 
When tanks would roll through, Finnish men would jam logs into their tracks, effectively grounding the heavy vehicles. They would then light up Molotov cocktails and throw them at the exhaust vents, blowing out the engines and destroying the tanks. Several tons of Soviet engineering were brought down with some wood, alcohol, and a couple of glass bottles. And it wasn't the end of the Soviets' woes. In the two years leading up to the war, Stalin's unhinged paranoia led to him gutting the Red Army's leadership and replacing seasoned commanders with promoted rookies. The grand strategy in place may have been sound, but much of the middle tiers of the army were woefully out of their depth, especially against such an unconventional defensive force. They immediately experienced crippling traffic jams. The roads into the country were small and far apart, meaning they had to move single file and without the support of those parallel to them. The roads themselves were poor quality and ruined by extreme weather, not to mention the Finnish resistance. So even with 1,000 tanks ready to fight, the Soviets could barely get any of them into the country. Stuck in traffic jams, the Red Army couldn't fan out and thus were surrounded easily. With destroyed vehicles now blocking the few usable roads, these army columns were brought to an almost total standstill. Finland had littered the border with booby traps and mines, making the Soviets hesitant to stray from the main roads. The Finns also dotted lone snipers throughout the forests, men dressed all in white who would lie in wait for hours on the lookout for potential targets. A single sniper was capable of delaying a Russian convoy for hours as they were so difficult to detect and frighteningly accurate due to growing up hunting the Finnish forests. By far the most notorious of these snipers was the White Death himself, Simo Haya. Haya had grown up near Viapuri, the first city that the invading Red Army would take if the Mannerheim Line failed. For him, as was the case for almost all other Finns, this war was deeply personal, in stark contrast to most of the Soviets crossing the border who had little connection to the conquest of Finland. Throughout the conflict, Haya racked up over 500 kills, making him the most lethal marksman in military history even though he was only in combat for less than 100 days. Haiha would take up position first thing in the morning before daybreak and long before any enemies were expected to pass by. He would cover himself in as many layers as he could and lie flat in the snow with a small mound of snow in front of him. As the war dragged on, the temperatures would dip down to as low as negative 40. Yet Haiha would lay there, waiting, snacking on bread and sugar to keep his body warm. Armed with the Seiko M2830, Hayaha opted to forego any kind of scope. He didn't want the glint to give away his position, or to have to raise his head to look through it. With the iron sights he'd grown so familiar with, he could keep hunkered down out of sight while still being accurate. It also helped that he was only 5 foot 3 inches. As the enemies approached, he would pack snow into his mouth so that his breath wouldn't steam up as it passed his lips and the rest of the barrel of the rifle on the snowy mound he built earlier to cool it and reduce the smoke trails from his shots. He'd sit there, watching the enemy for a long time before firing, studying their movements, counting their numbers, and lulling them into a false sense of security. Then he'd pull the trigger. On the 21st of December, 1939, Hayaha achieved his highest daily count of 25 kills. The Finnish propaganda machine noticed and quickly drummed up a kind of mythology around the man. Everything about his character perfectly summed up what they wanted the Finnish spirit to be. But as a result, Viewing him accurately through a historical lens is challenging. Hayahak gained the nickname White Death during the course of the war, which was supposedly what the Soviets would call him. That has since been debunked, and it's clear that the nickname came from within the Finnish ranks. Could the Finns have also been exaggerating his kill count for the sake of morale? Very possibly. The best evidence, however, for Hayahak's efficiency comes from his own private memoir. Hayaha did not write this for an audience, yet in the book he estimates that he killed around 500 people in what he calls his sin list. This was only published long after his death. Zooming back out, we can see a brutal winter covering the front line, freezing soldiers on both sides. Extreme conditions wrought havoc on the Red Army. Due to the scale of the invasion, much of the Soviet equipment was woefully out of date and in poor condition. Stalin had not invested enough resources in the decades prior to the war in outfitting an army as large as the one he fielded. In comparison, the basic but reliable Finnish weaponry and equipment performed well in the icy conditions. The Mannerheim Line was holding strong. Spanning 80 miles with 106 concrete structures built into it, the Finns had done everything they could to make life difficult for their enemy. Barbed wire laced through the forest in all directions, and hundreds of mines and granite blocks were sunk into any and all roads leading toward the front. The Soviets tried to fight through the line all December, first on the left near Taipale, then on the right at Soma, with no luck. 
The Finns had held such an advantageous position that even getting close to them was nearly impossible. That December, the Red Army experienced colossal casualties. They had lost thousands of men trying to break through with nothing to show for their efforts. More than 250 of their tanks had been destroyed at this point, and morale was slumping lower and lower by the day. The soldiers were freezing, under-equipped, fighting an enemy they couldn't get anywhere close to, and being mismanaged at every turn, leading to unnecessary losses on a daily basis. Meanwhile, north of Lake Ladoga, Finland achieved one of its most important and decisive victories in the war. Here, the weather conditions were even worse than at the Mannerheim Line. Without the focal point of dug-in fortifications, the Finns were able to use their superior maneuverability to their advantage and surrounded the flagging Russian soldiers. During the battle for Tolovayarvi, around 630 Finns lost their lives, but in doing so, they captured almost an equal number of prisoners and killed nearly 10 times as many, with even more injuries on top of that. The Soviets panicking without clear instructions from above didn't know what to do. Some retreated while others dug in, meaning those left behind were quickly surrounded and wiped out. The Finns even had a word for these pockets, motis, the piles of timber that they would come back to later to chop into more convenient sizes. The decisive rebuff of the Soviet offensive allowed the Finns to secure the middle of the country for the duration of the war. But further north it started to go wrong. The Soviets started to make gains, and while they were slowed down by skiing Finns with hit-and-run tactics, they couldn't be held back forever. The Soviets took the town of Suomusalami for a few days until Finnish reinforcements from the 9th Division arrived to take it back. Surrounding the town, the Finns lured the Red Army into a retreat through the woods. Once in the cover of the trees, the stealthy Finnish ski troops attacked, making short work of the enemy. But the good news could only last so long. The advantage the Soviets had from the start of the war was what carried them through to victory. In February, they redoubled their efforts and corrected failing strategies. All of their focus went into the south as they worked to pierce the Mannerheim line. Rather than sending vehicles charging through, they amassed them in large groups and crawled them forward slowly, surrounded by hordes of soldiers. The shelling was near constant. On February 1, 1940, more than 300,000 shells were fired at the Finns. As battle-hardened and ready as the Finns were, they'd also been there enduring the harsh winter just as the Soviets had but without the luxury of reinforcements. They were exhausted and running low on supplies. Each subsequent day, the Soviets increased the pressure, sending through wave after wave of armored vehicles and soldiers. The country with the most casualties in the Second World War is by far and away the Soviets, with over 27 million deaths, a number that eclipses any other country in Europe by an enormous margin. A large part of this was Stalin's military strategy. Throw men at the problem. If they die, more will take their place. Like water eroding a cliff, eventually everything will break. And on February 11th, the Mannerheim line broke. The Finns tried to fall back to the intermediate line, but it was too late. The Red Army finally had something it had been lacking all winter, momentum. They gained ground all the way through February and into March. Mannerheim at the start of the war had been relying on one thing to see his country through the war, foreign support. The Finns would hold the line and wait for an ally to give them equipment or backing needed to turn the tide. But as the Red Army moved further and further into Finland, with each passing day it became clear foreign aid would never arrive. On March 13th, the Finnish government requested a ceasefire. Their nation was battered and exhausted. The soldiers had nothing left to give, and there were no new soldiers to take their place. It was over. The Karelian Isthmus was given to the Soviets, along with the ports that they had requested prior to the war. The Finns had lost. But had they? At the start of the war, it looked inevitable that Finland would suffer a total defeat. The Soviets predicted victory in just 12 days, yet here they were over three months later, only having lost around 11% of their land. They'd lost 25,904 soldiers, but had killed upwards of 160,000 Soviets, with around 100,000 more wounded. Just as the war was coming to a close, a story appeared in the newspaper declaring that Simo Haya had been hit in the face with an explosive round and that the Finnish war hero had died on March 6th. His body had been piled up with a number of other soldiers, further destroying the morale of the Finnish army. But that afternoon, the editor of the newspaper had a letter come across his desk. The sender politely explained that there was an error in his story that would need to be corrected. It was signed, Simo Haiha. The man had woken up on the 13th of March, the day that peace was declared. Now for a deeper dive into Simo Haiha's life, check out The White Death, Best Sniper in History, or watch this video instead.